Good evening, everyone. Great to be back at BBI. We just had a little Christmas vacation for about two weeks, so we're back with a, a new session of, of lessons. So before we do, we want to do our hymnology. We're going to study I Must Tell Jesus and look at the story behind this great song. The author and composer of this hymn is uh, Elisha A. Hoffman. I never know if it's a girl that they spelled Elisha wrong or if it's Elisha like the prophet in the Old Testament. So I'm just going to go with Elisha like the prophet in the Old Testament. Gives the following account of its writing. During a pastorate in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, there was a woman to whom God permitted many visitations of sorrow and affliction. Coming to her home one day, I found her much discouraged. She unburdened her heart, concluding with the question, Brother Hoffman, so it must be Elisha. Okay, Brother Hoffman, what shall I do? What shall I do? I quoted from the word and then added, You cannot do better than to take all of your sorrows to Jesus. You must tell Jesus. For a moment she seemed lost in meditation and then her eyes lighted as she exclaimed, Yes, I must tell Jesus. As I left her home, I had a vision of that joy illuminated face and I heard all along my paths the echo, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Reaching his study, Reverend Mr. Hoffman penned the words quickly for what has become one of the best loved songs. And before very long, he had composed the melody to fit the words as well. The hymn first appeared in the 1894 edition of Pentecostal Hymns, of which Mr. Hoffman was one of the music editors. The tune Orwigsburg is named for Orwigsburg, Pennsylvania, where Eli uh, Elisha <laughs> Hoffman was born on May the 7th in 1839. Elisha Albright Hoffman, though never formally trained in music, has contributed more than 2,000 gospel songs to Christian hymnody. For most of his hymns, Mr. Hoffman supplied both the words and the music. Several of his still popular gospel songs include Are You Washed in the Blood? Is Your All on the Altar? What a Wonderful Savior? Leaning on the Everlasting Arms? And Glory to His Name. In addition to his songwriting and assisting in the compilation and editing of 50 different songbooks, Hoffman pastored several evangelical and Presbyterian churches throughout the country. He also served with the Evangelical Association Publishing House in Cleveland, Ohio for 11 years. It is through his gospel songs, however, that Elisha Hoffman ministered most effectively to the greatest number of people around the world. So I must tell Jesus, what a great story behind that one. Since we don't have a whole lot, since I, I used up a little bit of time to get prepared for class tonight, we won't sing it, but just know that that's the great story behind it. So we start a new session this evening on an introduction to singing. What we're going to do for the next several weeks, next eight weeks or so, is I'm going to teach you the fundamentals to singing. And we're going to go through the, the proper breathing techniques, diction, vocal uh, uses, and things like that. Uh, tonight we're going to start with a general overview of singing, especially singing within the church. Um, but just know that uh, at the end of the course you can expect to understand the basics of correct technique in using your voice. Uh, you'll be effectively able to instruct others and aid them in vocal improvement. You'll know how to sing with greater skill and hopefully have a, a greater, if not just a basic understanding of the principles of singing. So, general overview. My goal is to help you as a director to have a better understanding of the basic mechanics of singing. I'm not saying that I'm going to be able to turn you into a great singer, but I'm going to teach you the premises on which great singing is founded upon and for you to build from there. The basic mechanics. You need to be able to inspire others and help others to improve their skills and talents as God has given them. So here goes a general overview of singing within the church. Number one, there is a prerequisite to good godly singing. You can't just get up and just let her rip. There is a prerequisite to it. You must have a God-given desire, first of all, to sing for His glory. Wouldn't give you a plug nickel, I wouldn't give you a real nickel for somebody that is talented, but yet totally empty of the Holy Spirit of God. We don't need people that are the greatest singers in the world to get up in our church to impress people and to put on a performance. What we need are people that love God so much that they want to exalt His name in song and to do it with all of their heart and soul and to put their best effort into it and to never be satisfied that they're doing enough. We need people that are hungry to give more to God and want to go further for the cause of Christ, for the glory of God. Aside from having a God-given desire to sing for His glory, you must have enthusiasm. 
The single most vital factor to the success of any choir, of course, aside from prayer and practice, as we learned last year, there must be enthusiasm. If people are not excited about the songs that they sing, nobody wants to hear them sing. If you don't look like you're enjoying what you're singing, nobody wants to see you sing, much less hear you sing. By the way, even blind people can tell if you're not enthusiastic about the way that they sing. They can hear your facial expressions. They can hear in the tones of your voice whether or not you're really getting into the song. So have some enthusiasm. Nobody enjoys listening to somebody that's not really enthusiastic about what they're singing about. You can attest, and you know that I'm right, when I say that there are a lot of people that when they get up and they sing, they look like they're in pain, they look uncomfortable, they look like they can't wait to sit down, and that, my friend, does not cause me to want to say, hey man, hallelujah, praise the Lord, that's a good singer right there. It makes me want to go sit down and let somebody else sing that's going to enjoy it. We're not there for a performance, but you should do the best that you can and enjoy what you're doing because it's a privilege. It's an honor. You should at least appear that way as well. Also under the prerequisites that just know that as long as you have a normal speaking voice, you can learn to sing. A lot of people say, there's no hope, there is no way, and I don't believe it. I believe that if you have a normal speaking voice, you can learn to sing. It may take more practice. It may take more work. But the point is, there is hope for anyone that has a normal speaking voice. You can learn how to sing. Now, not everybody is going to be able to sing as well as the person that they may try to compare themselves to. You're not going to be able to sing just like so-and-so. And it doesn't make any difference how poorly or how well you sing presently. The prerequisite is that you first have a desire to learn and to do better for the glory of God. If you want to learn how to sing so that you can make a career out of it and leave God totally out of the picture, I don't want to help you. But I do want to help you if you desire to learn to hone the talent that God has given you and to improve so that you can give God more. You must be willing, must be willing to study and to do it with confidence, knowing that you are going to learn. That with practice, there will come progress. And you must have confidence and seek the pleasure that singing brings. A lot of people don't look like singing is too pleasurable when they sing. But, you know, the, nevertheless, there are a few things that are less pleasurable, that are more pleasurable than singing, I should say. Singing is one of the most pleasurable experiences for the human being. And you must have a desire to serve Christ. And if you have the right mindset and the right heart about it, you'll have the help of God to get better. I don't know about you, but I have heard stories of people who were basically tone deaf or absolutely had no talent when it came to playing the piano, but because they had a sincere desire to do it to the glory of God, they prayed and they begged and they asked God, please give me the ability. Help me to learn. Help me to be able to do this. And it just happened. And God blessed. Now they can sing. Now they can play. Now they can do what they once could not do. God's looking for people that just are willing. And to be willing to do it for the right reason. Among the other prerequisites, it's you need to have an absence of fear. Because fear is probably the singer's greatest enemy. Fear is what's going to cause you to forget your words. Fear is what's going to cause you to forget your part. Fear is what's going to cause you to have an emotional breakdown while everybody's staring at you. Fear is going to be the reason that when you're done singing, your chin is black and blue because your hand's shaking so much you beat your chin to death with the microphone hand, okay? You need to learn to handle your fear. There are people that are talented and God has blessed them with great ability, but you get them in front of people and they're done. You let them sing with their eyes closed or with their back turned to the congregation and they'll do okay. Let them hide in the baptistry and do it with a the microphone there and they'll do all right. But you get them in front of a group and they're shot. You've got to get over that. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? There's people everywhere there. You ain't never seen a choir until you've seen the choir that we're going to sing in heaven. You've got to get over and get over your fears and one way that you can is pray for God to help you and to deliver you from the spirit of fear that cripples you in this area of your life. Let God set you free in this area. You've got to be optimistic. It is a prerequisite. Before you can learn that you have to be optimistic, believing, I'm going to learn. I am going to improve in my singing. I am going to develop a greater understanding of this, and I'm going to improve. But you must not let pride rise up. I've said this often. I just said this in the class uh, prior to this one. 
that one of the greatest things that musicians battle amongst themselves is jealousy and pride because we're always comparing ourselves to this one that obviously they're more talented than I because they can do things that we can't do or because they can sing better than I can. You know, God must have greater favor on them when we compare ourselves to this, that, and the other. But what we should be doing is saying, whatever I am able to do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability and learn how to do it even better. And I'm going to do it to the glory of God regardless of how it compares to anybody else because we're not doing it for anybody else but to the Lord. So take what you have and build on it. It may be just a little bit. It may be a lot. Some people are blessed naturally from birth. Some people it takes them a lifetime to develop a little. But the point is you have the ability. And if you'll be optimistic about it you can grow. But be careful. Don't let pride rise up inside of you. There's a difference between being confident and being arrogant. So don't be arrogant about yourself but be confident that God has allowed you this honor and this privilege. I'm going to do the best I possibly can. Don't sell yourself or God short. And last of all, the last prerequisite you must have is you just must be willing to say yes and do your best. Saying yes and doing your best is the last prerequisite to learning how to sing better. So, a general overview of singing. Number one, the prerequisites. Things that must take place first. Then, we must examine the purpose. Music is often called the language of the emotions, and it furnishes greater personal satisfaction and pleasure than any other art form. Think about it. You can sing and make music anywhere. If you're a photographer, you can't take pictures everywhere that you go. You can't take pictures while you're driving. I mean, you can, but it's not a good idea. If you're, if you're a, an artist with an easel and, and, uh, and canvas or on uh, paper with pen or pencil, you can't express yourself through your art in all places and in all manners, but you can with music. You can sing when you're away from home, when you're at home, when you're going down the road, when you're swimming, when you're skydiving, whatever you're doing, you can sing. I wouldn't <laughs> sing if you're skydiving if you have dentures because they'll fly out when you're coming down out of that airplane. I've seen it happen. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> the purpose. God gave us the ability to make music to express ourselves back to Him. Uh, music, or singing in general, is scriptural. The purpose is that we are scripturally commanded to do so. Not only are we encouraged to sing, but we are commanded to sing. And in fact, in the book of the, uh, the, in the 47th Psalm, verse number 7, the Bible commands us to sing with understanding. Not to do it ignorantly and just to have this whimsical attitude that I, you know, I always talk about people that like to sing by letter and they joke about their ignorance and they're just going to sing and just let her fly. And they don't want to learn. They don't want to get better. They don't want to improve. In other words, they're satisfied with mediocrity. They're satisfied with being in the kiddie pool into the swimming pool. Forget it. I don't want to be in the kiddie pool. That's the most dangerous place that there is. It'll fool you into thinking that you're better. You think you can swim when you're in the kiddie pool. But when you get in the deep end, you realize, oh, this is all another ball game. I'd rather not waste my time in the shallow end. I'd rather get out there where you can do more and go further. So don't settle for just where you are today. Have the desire to progress and to learn to the glory of God. But also in the 33rd Psalm, verse number 3, the Bible commands us to sing up to the Lord a new song and to play skillfully. That in all of our music, we ought to be doing it skillfully. That means if you don't understand music, you need to learn, study, and understand music. If you're going to sing, you need to learn how to sing better. If you're going to play the piano, you need to learn how to play the piano better. Because God deserves the best that we have. And as long as we have breath in our lungs and our nervous system causes our fingers to move and we can still make music, we need to be developing the talent God gives to give it back to Him to the best of our abilities. Because He deserves it. There's also a natural purpose to it. Music, it was naturally endowed by our Creator. It was naturally given to us for us to give back to Him. Now, some people are given more talent than others. Some people may have just a few drops in the bucket compared to somebody who seems like they're carrying around a five-gallon bucket full of talent. Nobody said that God had to give the talent evenly distributed, but I believe that everybody has musical talent in them somewhere. Because our God loves music so much that He wants us to give it back to Him in return. And I believe that our Creator gave everybody a little bit of talent in some way. Some choose to increase their talent more than other people do. And they do so through prayer, practice, and participation. They don't just sit on the sidelines and let other people do. 
They want to get involved and to help and to learn and to grow as well. But then there are some people that choose to suppress their talents, not use them at all. Not try to hone that skill, not try to grow that talent that God gave them. They just do like that guy in the Bible and went and buried his talent in the ground because he's afraid he'd lose it. But he also couldn't use it. God gave us all some kind of ability for a purpose. We must get it to use and start doing with it what we can. Another purpose is that we are to use our music and our singing in order to honor God by encouraging our brothers and sisters in Christ, by using, the Bible says to exhort one another, and the, there are three kinds, of, the Bible tells us to use uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to do that, to encourage each other in song. Sometimes you don't know how to say it, but the only way that you know how to express it is through music. Because it's the language of the soul. The emotions. No greater way to express it a lot of times than in just by singing. But also the purpose of the music that we have and we're supposed to be using rightly is to worship God. Singing to Him. That's what hymns are. Remember we studied that. But also we're supposed to be using our, God to pr our uh, music to praise God. That's when we sing songs about Him. Those are gospel songs. So in a general overview of singing... We also want to not only look at the prerequisites for it and the purpose for it, but also the preparation that goes into it. Remember, I, I try to drive this into your heads and, and hopefully into your hearts every single week that singing paves the way for the preaching of the Word of God. It's really the garden tiller that goes before the seed spreader. The right song could often be what it takes to soften the heart of a sinner to receive the seed of Scripture on a soft, fertile soil rather than on hard, cold soil. But if we choose a song for the sake of its singability rather than for its message and for it, the blessing the Holy Spirit could use it for and with, get a big spiritual goose egg for our grade for the service for that day because we choose to sing songs that we enjoy rather than the songs that the, that the Lord desires for us to sing in that particular time. Don't sterilize your music program by just trying to choose a song solely for the, the music. Don't, don't just pick a song because you like the way it sounds. Don't just pick a song because so-and-so sang it and you like the way that they did it. Make sure that you put some time and some effort into choosing your songs because a pretty song can be spiritually dead. It can be spiritually empty. So don't just pick a song because you like the way that it plays, the way the harmonies match, and the way the chorus rolls together, things like that. Make sure that you're choosing the songs and the preparation in the music program is something that you're putting time and effort into so that you know that God can use it to prepare the way for the preaching. The aim should never be to move the feet, but instead to move the heart. So make sure you keep your focus on the right thing. Another overview of music and singing is that in the preparation of it, we should commit ourselves to developing our own musical ability and to improve our church's music program overall as well. A choir director that's not interested in practice, in improvement, or holding a high standard of quality really should be replaced because he's holding everybody back instead of helping them move forward. We don't need people that's causing us to regress. We need people that will actually lead us and help us to progress. Our churches cannot afford to go very much longer with, quote, choir leaders who are more accurately just simply song selectors because they don't actually lead anything. They don't actually teach anything. We need choir directors to teach generations that are here and that are to come to sing and to sing properly. Otherwise, no one will know how to sing right unless the world teaches them. Is that what we want? Do we want the world to be teaching our children how to sing instead of God's people teaching God's children how to sing? If we don't, they're going to learn from Beyonce. Have you ever noticed that a lot of the younger kids, when they get an uh, opportunity to sing a solo, they sound just like Britney Spears or somebody like that? That sounds just like the world, the way that they slide in and out of their notes, the way they do the vocal runs and all this stuff, and they sing through their nose, and they're really whining because they're trying to sound like the newest pop princess that come off of MTV or something like that. Because they pattern their abilities after the world because nobody in the church is trying to teach them anything. They just say, here, sing that. How? Just sing. How? Well, you know, sing. Take some time and teach people how to sing. Otherwise... 
don't get upset. When the next generation of Christians comes along, and they all sound just like the world. Because it's the world that gets the biggest influence in them today. Because most people let the TV raise their kids. You can't even trust the Disney Channel anymore. I'm not here to preach about that. But good night. You can't even trust the Family Channel anymore. They changed their name because it's not even family friendly. And they recognize that, so they quit calling it the Family Channel. That ought to be a red flag to people. <whistles> this thing ain't healthy for us to raise our kids with. This is not good for our children. We ought to be doing something by investing the Word of God and things of God into them rather than letting the world do the raising of our children. Anyway, commit to developing your own musical ability. Make quality a high priority. A leader can only cause the people to rise as far as they have gone themselves. So seek to improve so that you can help others to improve. That is how you can determine the level to which a choir, a class, or any organization will rise. It will only rise as high as the one who is in charge, the one who's doing the leading, the one who's doing the teaching. So therefore, all leaders, all teachers, anybody in a position of authority must constantly seek to grow, to improve, to practice, so that they can constantly help other people to grow, to improve, and to practice, so that they progress in all that they do. Seek to improve yourself so you can help to improve others. Last of all, we, we, we talked about the prerequisites in our general overview to singing. We talked about the purpose in our singing. We talked about the importance of the right kind of preparation in our singing. But last of all, in our presentation, Dr. Wally Beebe said, it's never wrong to do right. I've said that so many times. I say it at school. I say it at church. I say it here. That it's never wrong to do right. Do not settle for just cause because it's the way it's always been done. Do it right for the sake of doing it right. If you have no other reason to do anything but to do it because it's the right thing to do, that's good enough. Do right because it's right to do. If you want to grow, maybe you should consider enrolling in voice lessons. If you really have that desire, that strong of a desire to improve your singing skills, seek to enroll in voice. You know what people do when they want to learn how to play the piano? They go buy a trumpet. No, they don't. They call somebody and say, hey, Where'd you learn how to learn, play the piano at? And they'll say, oh, well, Wanda Marlowe taught me how to play the piano. And guess what they want to do? They want to call Wanda Marlowe. Now, if she's booked up, they'll be like, well, who else can I go? And they'll find a piano teacher. If you want to learn how to sing, I highly recommend that you find somebody that you consider to be a talented and qualified person to help teach you, a capable singer, that can help you learn and help you improve. It goes the same way in sports, in academics, especially in golf. If you want to improve your golf game, you play golf with people that are better than you because they'll be able to help you to make corrections and adjustments to your grip and all these different things. They'll teach you how to hold your arms and improve your backswing and following through and things like that. If you want to be better at basketball, play with people that are better than you. So if you want to learn how to be a better singer, a better musician, hang around people that are better than you are. Learn from somebody that you consider to be better than you and let them help you somehow, some way. Find somebody you think is qualified and capable. Now, it's going to be humbling to have somebody invited into your life to point out all your mistakes. Oh, joy, that's going to be fun, isn't it? To have somebody to tell you, whoo, that was terrible, do it again. To have somebody that cares enough to be so honest with you to tell you that was terrible. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> Love you in the Lord. Amen. You've got to, it, you, but you got to open, your, open yourself up to that because if you, you have to look at it this way, you can either continue to make the same mistakes and have the same flaws that you've had in the past, or you can let somebody help you learn how to overcome those and improve. You're either satisfied with how you are now, or you seek to get better, and so you get somebody that can help you through the learning process to help you improve in your singing. Somebody that can recognize and correct the issues that you may have. Who knows? But you've got to learn to do it with your soul, not just to be no perfect. Oh, my soul. There are, I, I talked to a, a music director just a few months ago. I was tuning the piano for them, and um, they, they made mention. They said you know, this was at a, a fairly large Baptist church that was more of the uh, <coughs> prim and proper stiff neck kind of environment, you know, where they were just 
everything was was just done just so clear cut and there was no deviation from the schedule of any kind uh, itinerary was set weeks in advance songs were selected six weeks ago and they're going to do them by george no matter what and couldn't believe the words that were said that choir director told me he said you know sometimes i just enjoy getting away from all this structure prim and proper everything's got to be done just so and go to some of these smaller country churches where people just sing for the love of it they just sing because they enjoy it. And they just rear back and put their heart and their soul in it. And you can tell that they're singing about something that they know is real. You can put so much effort in doing it perfectly, it just sterilizes it to death and there ain't no blessing left in it. There is a fine line between being concentrating on being perfect and being concerned about doing your best. You've got to learn to express from your soul, not just being perfect on the notes, but singing from your heart and doing it with the right motivation and the right reason. Don't be so musically correct that it loses all the personality and contains no blessing for you, for anybody that hears, or for God himself. Learn to do it. You're going to make mistakes. Just go ahead and get over it. You're going to make mistakes. I hate it, but, you know, you're going to. And it's good for you. Walt Disney said every, every young person ought to experience at least one good, humiliating, devastating disappointment in their life. Because it's good for you. It helps you grow. It builds character. Yes, sir, it does. Because then you learn, oh, I'm not perfect. And then you're not afraid to make mistakes later on. You know, you know there's one surefire way to never make a mistake. It's just to never try. If you try, you're going to make a mistake. Go ahead and accept it. You know what? When I try something new, I go ahead and say, well, this ought not take long. I'm either going to get hurt, I'm going to hurt somebody, or I'm just going to really regret doing this. But here it goes. Make sure you put your protective gear on, put your helmet and glasses or whatever you got. Make sure you don't get hurt too bad. But, you know, when you learn, you have, you have to be willing to accept the fact you're going to make mistakes. Last of all, the presentation, your motivation should be to sing as if the Savior is sitting right in front of you. That if you get so nervous when you sit in front of people because you see all these faces, and I know at some churches like at Bethel here, when you got 200, 300 people that are staring at you, you're going, <laughs> Lord, please don't let me mess up. <laughs> and before you know it, the thing that consumes your thoughts the most is how everybody thinks that you <laughs> You're more concerned about how everybody thinks and feels and how they react to your performance instead whether or not the Lord thought that you did a good job. Adopt the attitude and put your spiritual blinders on that all you see are faces. You don't see brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. When I sing, I scan from side to side. I don't stare at one person because that makes it really look like you're getting ready to throw up because you're just... <gasps> you know, people are going, oh, here it comes. Everybody get out of the way. You got to, you got to learn to loosen up and relax. And if you'll scan it, not, not at the front row, because then it really makes them uncomfortable because they can see your eyeballs. They're going, mm, it's tending that sorrow conviction towards me, I'll show you. But if you'll just look over people's heads and scan from one side back to the other, not by going like that because you make yourself sick, but you know, just little by little, like, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Don't just stare straight ahead and get all zoned out and everybody going, oh, no, this ain't good. <laughs> Don't lock your knees, you know, because you're about to pass out. <laughs> Learn to relax a little bit and forget about all the people that's there. Just see faces, but not brother and sister so-and-so, this person and that person, because you're there to sing for your Lord. And keep that in mind, God, I'm doing this for you. I really hope you enjoy this. Help me to do the best that I possibly can. And then let God bless it. Forget about everybody else that's there. If you make a mistake, learn to sing through it. You're going to turn bright red. Go ahead and accept it. I turn bright red so much because I embarrass myself. Or, Well, sometimes I do. I don't really get embarrassed by people all that often. But I guess I, I, I either embarrass myself or I realize I just embarrassed my wife. And that makes me turn bright red because I realize that's, a, that's never a good thing to do either. So I, I'm, I'm so used to turning so many shades of red that I can tell when it's happening. And I just go with it because it's going to happen. Some people blush like at the drop of a hat. All you got to do is look at them funny. They go, <laughs> and they just turn just flushed as can be. Don't be ashamed of it. Just accept it. That's the way you are. That's the way you're going to be. 
for all you know, people think that's what happens when you get full of the Spirit. So go ahead and get used to it. <laughs> Amen! Hallelujah! So, last of all, in your presentation, make sure that when you sing, that you do so, and you sing to the glory of God. Okay? Now, what you've got to look forward to a few weeks, like I told you a minute ago, we're going to be taking some songs. I'm going to be giving you songs. I'm going to teach you how to break it down and learn when to take breaths throughout songs so that you just don't take them whenever. Like a lot of people, when they sing Amazing Grace, they breathe totally at the wrong places. They'll go, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And it's just chop, 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 chop. And it goes, it just doesn't flow. You sing like you speak. There are punctuation marks for a reason. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Use the punctuation. I'll teach you all that. And then we're going to not only learn when to breathe, I'm going to teach you how to breathe properly, how to use your diaphragm, not singing from your throat, how to push the air through and sing from your torso so you don't destroy your vocal cords because you get them so tight that they can't do nothing. One of the secrets of the Southern Gospel trade is that many of those uh, first tenors that sing so really high and loud and everything, that a lot of the times they sing so forcefully to hit that note that everybody loves to hear them sing. Their vocal cords bleed. Yeah. It's dangerous. It is devastating how many of them are out of a job because they destroyed their vocal cords for that extra standing ovation. What a lot of them have told me that they do is that they take an overwhelming amount of Tylenol and different painkillers that numbs their vocal cords, that takes so much of it, on the verge of Tylenol poisoning even, just so that their vocal cords are numb and that they can't sense the bleeding and the pain and the discomfort that comes with it. That's why they can't sing back to back a lot because they have to go through a healing process when you sing like that. So take care of it. If God gave you the talent to sing, this is your instrument. You can't go and call somebody in to have it tuned. You know, you can't get it fixed if you destroy it. It's gone. So learn to take care of it. So we're going to talk about vocal um, health as well, how to properly take care of yourself. We're going to teach you about diction, how to properly pronounce words, where to put emphasis in words and things like that so that people actually understand what you're saying. You can read it. And you think you're saying it, but when you sing, your words don't come out as clear as you think they do. And I, I, I'll share several songs with you in that lesson. Many times growing up at Pleasant Grove, there would be songs that would get sung, and for the life of me, I never could figure out what they were singing. And I thought, why are they singing about hot dogs? Because that's exactly what they sounded like, or baked ham goods. I didn't know what they were saying. I'd, I'd go around the house, and I'd be singing something, and it made absolutely no sense. And Mom and Dad would be like, what did you just say? Like, I don't know. That's what they said. The choir sang Sunday. And when I got old enough to see a youth, uh, uh, an adult choir book and be able to read it, I go, huh, that's what they've been saying for all these years, you know? It's because people don't know how to properly pronounce words when they sing. It's different. So I'm going to teach you that. And then we're going to teach you different vocal techniques, how to, how to elongate your range, how to go lower and stretch your vocal cords that way, how to enable yourself to be able to go higher and stretch your vocal cords that way. So we're going to spend a lot of, not eight weeks in this session about singing. Now, like I said, I'm not going to turn you into an opera singer. I'm not going to make you a professional singer where you're going to go out and you're going to have your first album done because you've been through my little late week session. That's not how it's going to work. What I'm going to do is going to give you the basics, the fundamentals, and the groundwork for you to learn and build off of so at least you'll know more than you did when you come in so that you can have a, a good direction to go in when you go out so that you can learn and teach your choir to improve from this moment forward. Okay? All right, let's bow our heads. God, thank you so much for the opportunity again to stand. Thank you for the, the lesson that we had to be able to teach tonight. We ask you, God, that you would bless every student that has made their way out. And for everybody that's watching this on YouTube and wherever they may, may be seeing the class and recording, I pray that you would encourage them and help them to dedicate their musicianship, their talents, and all things that they do, that they've been given of you to return to you, that they would do so, that they would dedicate their singing and their playing and all of their musicianship to the glory of God, to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to the use of Christ in His kingdom. Help us, God, I pray, to be a better Christian in 2016 than we were in 2015. Use us greatly, we pray, in this, these last days. We love you. Thank you for all that you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a good night. We'll see you next time. Sorry.